What I'm looking at first is where this starts and stops. I'm looking at the key intervals here. The key intervals are, what's, what's one point that I'm going to have on my graph? Where's the x start and stop? Zero. Zero's not up there. Don't care about the zero. I care about the negative one, because that's where we're going to trade off between one piece and, another, and the next piece. Do you get what I'm saying? I want, to, I want you to find the places where you're switching between functions. One place is at negative one, where's the other place? Sure. Here's what our directions say. Piecewise functions have directions. It says for a certain range that's less than or equal to negative 1, so everything over here, I'm going to be doing something. Between these two numbers, I'm going to be doing something else. After this number, I'm going to be doing something else. That's what, how piecewise functions work. Nod your head if you're okay with that. Now we just grab the pieces, making sure we don't overlap these functions, or these, these intervals. What happens when the x's are less than or equal to negative 1? What are we doing for this range? So we've already broken it up. We're going to go piece by piece. We're looking at this piece right now. Which of the directions has to do with this piece of information? Is this this piece? No, this is bigger than 1. That's, that's, that's the wrong way. Is it this piece? This is between negative 1 and 1. So we've got to be talking about this piece, and if you look at it, it says x is less than or equal to negative 1. So we know we're, we're this way. What do we have to graph for this, this piece right here? Zero. Wow, what's zero mean? What's zero mean? Horizontal line. Good. Where? Uh, this? Y equals zero. This. Which one? This? this. Do you know? Have I lost you? Have I lost you? Have I lost you? It would have to be horizontal. Listen, if, if the, the whole grouping of this kind of confuses you, just write them out differently. Say that you have y equals 0 for a certain bit. Say you have y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared for a certain bit. Say you have y equals x for a certain bit. It's the same thing. You're just grouping all these together in function and graphing them piece by piece. Do you see that? Okay, so this is the piece that's working where your x is less than negative 1 or equal to it. This is the piece that's working when you're between negative 1 and 1. And this is the piece that's working when you're greater than or equal to 1. Split it up if you have to, but you need to be able to graph each of those functions. So can you all tell me now, what does y equals 0 look like? The that is the x-axis. Yeah, that's a horizontal line at y equals 0. y equals a constant, right? We talked about that last time, that it's a horizontal line. So we're talking about this right there. Uh, one question I have for you, should I have an open circle or a closed circle here and why? Closed circle. And why? Good. Good, very good. Okay, check. Got it. Let's go to the next piece. The next piece works between negative 1 and 1. Now, do, do you also understand why, why we might have to have no equal sign here, and why if I did this, it would not be a function? It would be overlapping, be overlapping if these were, were different. Yeah, that's right. So you're, you're never going to see equals equals. You're always going to for the same value. You're not going to see that. So let's go and see what the, what is that? Oh my gosh, what is that? Do you recognize it? We had it before on the board, except the numbers were a little bit different. What is that? A circle. If you squared both sides, you get y squared over there, wouldn't you? If you added the x squared, you get x squared plus y squared equals 1. That's a circle. It's centered where, do you think? The origin. Origin. Somebody else tell me, what's the radius? 1. Mm -hmm. That's 1. Guys, if you have questions now, now would be a good time. Are you okay that this is a circle? How many people feel okay that that's a circle? You can see it. If you can't see it, don't raise your hand. If you can't see it, don't raise your hand. Can you see it? Not so much. If you can't see it... If you're like, oh my gosh, what in the world is that? Square both sides. You get y squared equals 1 minus x squared. If you add the x squared, you get x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now, this isn't, we, we cheated a little bit. We cheated because this is not an entire circle. An entire circle would be that. You clear? 
That would give the top half and the bottom half. What are we talking about? The top half or the bottom half? Which one? Top. Or just the top half right now. So we want the top half of a circle, the top half of a circle, centered at zero, zero, with a radius of one. Well, that looks to me like it's going from here to there. It's going to have an open circle right here, but it's been closed in by the previous function. That's kind of cool, right? We don't have an overlapping point. Is it going to have an open circle or a closed circle here? Open. Yeah. Again, why, why is it open? It's not equal to. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have that little, that little equals. So we've got our first piece. We've got y equals 0. We've got our second piece, the top half of the circle centered 0, 0, radius 1. The last piece. Oh, the last piece. y equals x. How are we going to do that? y equals x. What's y equals x look like? So so line that goes through the origin. Okay. Okay. So so normally we would just have a diagonal line, yeah? We, we've actually already graphed that. It's right here. So if we were to graph that, we'd have this thing. It'd be through the origin. It would it would go through the point 1, 1, wouldn't it? Because yeah. when you plug in 1, you get out 1. So I know that it's going to go through that point, And in fact, it's going to be solid because there's an equals there. So if I were to graph it, it would be that diagonal. However, I can't have it exist... I can't have it exist over here because then this whole thing wouldn't be a function. We're talking about just the piece that's that way. So I'm going to extend that line, erase this piece because I can't have it there. I've already got my piece in the function for that part, that, range, that interval. This is uh, the interval we're looking for. That's the piece in the function. Isn't it kind of cool looking? I think it's cool looking. Are you able to understand it? Can you follow? How many feel okay about that one? Good. So piecewise, uh, delineate your. Oh, you said, wait a minute. Uh, delineate that x-axis by the appropriate intervals. Graph each piece and you get down. Oh, cool. The last thing we're going to talk about for this section, we're going to talk about domain and range. More about domain and range. Hey, when I say domain to you, what do I mean if I if talk about the domain? X hey, more, more, gen, more general than just X. What if I'm using different variables? What does domain, someone over here, what does domain mean? The yeah, the inputs. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So when I'm talking about domain, what we mean is all the values you can input into a function. And yeah, you're, you're right, they're usually x's, typically. Unless you're dealing with like a position function, then you're talking about time. time. <coughs> if domain means all the inputs, what does the range mean? These are usually your y values or your f of x or whatever function you're dealing with. Now, in most cases, we have some sort of constraint, in real life especially, we have some sort of constraint on the domain. Let me give you a couple examples on this. Uh, let's say that, that I give you an example here. The area of a square. The area of a square. Now the domain is all the lengths of the sides of the square that you could plug into this, this function and get out an appropriate area. Can you tell me if there's any problems with numbers I plug in here? For instance, does S have to be, is S restricted in any way if we're talking about an actual square here? Oh, the sides do have to be the same, but I'm talking about, why can't it be negative? Because in real life there is no negative side. Sure. In the formula, you could plug in negative 3, couldn't you? It's going to give you 9. But in real life, can you draw, draw me a square right now with a side length of negative 3? Can you do it? Draw me negative 3. Oh, you can't do it, right? You're not going to make a square that has, when you measure on tape measure, it gives you negative 3. That doesn't happen because we don't measure uh, actual distances and units of length and negatives. So we'd say here, yeah, the area of, a, uh, area of square is S squared, but we have a restriction. The side length has to be greater than or equal to 0. 
you could have a trivial a trivial area, trivial square, here it is, that's it, has zero area, okay, no, no length of the sides. Uh, you have a zero length, but you can't have a negative, that's impossible. We also could have some formulaic restraints, like that one, like that one, y equals 1 over x. Is there any number I can't plug into that? Zero. Sure, why not? Yeah, because your teacher, the first time they showed you a fraction, say, now what number can't you divide by? And you're like, zero. And they go, oh, good job, little Johnny. You got it right. Never told you why, right? But you can't divide by zero. Any other number is going to work. Positive, negative, you're fine, but not zero. How about this one? F of x equals the square root of x. Here we couldn't have x equals zero. Can I have x equals zero there? Can you plug in zero to a square root? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, what's the square root of zero? zero. zero. Then you can do it. Uh, what can't you plug into square roots? Negative. Yeah, not inside. So we'd say, sure, this has a restraint where x, it could be equal to zero, but it can't be less than zero. It can't be negative. Otherwise, we, well, in the real numbers at least. Now let me make a little, little statement there. If you're talking about complex numbers, can you do it? Sure, yeah, you have an i. But if we're talking about complex numbers, I'm sorry, real numbers and graphing them on a, a real number system, well, we can't. We can't do that. Now, what we, what we know is that we're going to redefine domain just a little bit. I don't know if your book does this or not, but how we define, do, we're going to find a domain a special way in this class called the natural domain. The natural domain is basically everything that works in the, in the formula, including the maybe natural restraints of the, of the problem, like at the side length of the square, or the formulaic restraints of like a square root or uh, divided by zero. So natural domain basically means everything that works in your formula or your function. All values that work in the formula. Would you guys like to do some examples of finding natural domain? Or domain in general? I was hoping you'd say yes. <laughs> Natural Domain asked this question. It says, are there any problems with plugging in numbers, basically? So let's look at a real simple one. we got f of x equals x cubed. It asks, is there anything that you can't plug in, that you can't input into that? Can you think of anything? Can you plug in positives? Can you plug in zero? Can you plug in negatives? Yeah. Are there any problems you can think of? Can you plug in fractions? Yeah, yeah sure. You can plug in anything you want. If you can plug in anything you want and there's no problems, what we do is we say domain is simply all real numbers. For those of you who like to be very symbolic, you can do it differently. Uh, you can say x is an element of the real numbers. That's another way you can say it. 